Howdy folks, it's Meandering Mike in the Man Cave of Madness. It's the middle of the early evening, I guess you'd say. And we are going to start a how to play of Fort Jefferson Attack. Uh, this game I did a unboxing a couple of months ago, I think. Uh, and I just recently did an unboxing of their Battle of St. Louis game. I'm now going to actually do a how to play here and hope to before the end of next week do a playthrough of this game. Uh, so one of the quick things I like to talk about is some of the history, the background. Uh, Fort Jefferson is in what would be called mm, Kentucky at the time. Uh, Virginia Colony annexed the Kentucky Territory in 1776, I think it is. And uh, the head of <laughs> the militia of Virginia in Kentucky was George Rogers Clark. He's quite a character. He's an interesting history behind him. But uh, one of the things that he was concerned about was needing to have some kind of fort near the mouth of the Ohio River on the Mississippi. There was already forts up at uh, St. Louis. There was forts at Cahokia. Those were like about 120 to 140 miles north of where Fort Jefferson ended up. Uh, look down here at the map a little bit. Here's the Mississippi Ripper. This is Mayfield Creek. About two to three miles up that way is the mouth of the Ohio River connecting to the Mississippi. And up that way more on the west bank is St. Louis. On the east bank is uh, Cahokia. Uh, so back in 1777, Patrick Henry was the governor of Virginia. You've heard of Patrick Henry. Um, and... Basically, the idea that George Rogers Clark sort of fielded the idea, and Patrick Henry thought it was a good idea, but uh, Patrick Henry talked to the Spanish governor, Bernardo de Galvez, uh, of, of the you know, Florida and Louisiana Territory, uh, and also you know, talked to, to George Rogers Clark about it. Nothing happened at that time. Later, Thomas Jefferson, you've heard of him, became the governor of... Uh, Virginia colony in 1780, and George Rogers Clark uh, chewed on Jefferson ear, reminding him, hey, this would be a good idea. Jefferson hemmed and hawed a little bit and finally said, okay, let's do it. But he told George Rogers Clark, you know, so go buy the land, and he, he called them uh, not the Chickasaw Indians, but the Cherokee. He, he had the wrong name for the local tribe. The local tribe is the Chickasaw Indians, but he called them the Cherokees. But he said, you know, go buy the land, go get permission, whatever. And George Rogers Clark said, sure, but like basically he said, like, no, I'm not doing that. So in January of 1780, Fort Jefferson was built, like I said, two to three miles south of the Ohio River on the bank. Uh, this turned out to be prime Chickasaw hunting land, and they were not happy about it. And so come August-ish, I believe it is, in uh, 1780, they decided to attack and try to drive off uh, these Kentuckians and uh, other forces, forces from, there's militia from Cahokia up north came. There are Illinois regulars. Now, Illinois country is basically up that way. You know, it was just like Ohio's not a state yet. Illinois is not a state. Kentucky's not a state. Uh, uh, Missouri is on the other side of the river over here. That's that's not that's that's even more frontierish, um, but Illinois country up that way is sort of a an area that they talk a territory they talked about. So so these Illinois regulars <laughs> were actually you know dudes stationed pretty much permanently in this Mississippi region, either in Kentucky or up there near Cahokia or uh, around there. Uh, these are militia that came down. Uh, Fort Jefferson has some artillery, some swivel cannons. We'll show you how to set all these up. There's also some uh, Native Americans that were allies to the Americans here, the Kaskaskian Indians. These are civilians. And then we have a whole ton of Chickasaw Indians that decided to attack. They had a little bit of support from the British. Um... The Chickasaw were led by a war leader, Pio Minko, and there was a British lieutenant, Lieutenant Whitehead, 
And there was a local British, possibly Scottish, uh, trader dude. And that's the question is his name, Colbert or Colbert. They show a little Tam type hat. So I, I think he's Scottish or something, but who knows? Uh, and there are a whole bunch of Kakaski, or not, <laughs> Chickasaw Indians, sorry, the Kaskaskians of the American. So, so there are 19. Chickasaw Indian units of two flavors. Some have a six defense. The, the middle number, let's see here. I'll start to show you those. It's attack, defense, movement. On the back, you can see that this is disordered status. When you're disordered, you cannot move. You can attack, so you, but you still have a defense strength. All right. So there are quite a few Chickasaw Indians, along with the Chickasaw War Leader, Whitehead and Colbert, so that's 22 total units on the British slash Chickasaw side. The uh, Americans have three <coughs> fleeing civilian units, that's what they're called. And I'm actually set up, up on the map. I'll talk about how to win here real quick. We'll set up as we go. These icons, these blue icons, are the marker for the fleeing citizens, all right? Those are one of the objectives for the Chickasaws. If they can kill those, they can get a what they call a strategy point, which everyone else would call a victory point. Okay. Um, the other things that they can get points for is you see these red stars. I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. You, there's seven of them total here. One, two, three, four, five. And over on this island, six, seven. There are destruction markers. The... Uh, Chickasaw side, they can destroy those. They have to be in the space at the beginning of their turn. Uh, there's a playthrough out there that uh, the players they did, they had a minor error in there that they were doing it as they entered and captured it. They did it. It's at the beginning of the Chickasaw turn. So if the, or if, if the Chickasaws move in and the Americans can drive them off, they won't yet do that. So potentially you could fight back and forth for those squares. So you keep these destruction markers off on the side of the board and as these are destroyed, you put the marker on. Once those are destroyed, they can't be removed. And these fleeing citizens, once they're killed, they cannot be brought back. Other units, each side potentially have some cards. There are an event deck of 10 cards for each player. There is a chance to get units back. One, one card in here brings back two Chickasaw. One card in here brings back one American unit. However, this explicitly says you can't bring back a fleeing citizen. So... The one way for the Chickasaw to win is to score 10 points. If they kill three fleeing citizens and, cat and destroy all seven of those, they can win the game. There's also another way to score points, and that is, you see these, uh, on, on these hilltops, there's one right down here. Those are blockhouses. Those are very tough defensive positions because the Americans have in them swivel cannons. Now, you see that symbol? That's what the swivel cannon looks like. They are artillery pieces. In the rules, it mentions the unit types artillery. So that's a Ford artillery. That's a swivel cannon. Or on the, on the counter, it just says swivels. In the rules, they, they refer to them at one point as swivel cannon. But they are artillery because there's some rules that talk about artillery. So that's one thing to notice. I have mentioned before in some videos about mm, the, the rules for the historical game company need some editing and tightening. They could definitely benefit from a little more skilled war game type. I think they're trying to do it for uh, your more typical audience, but I'll tell you, just with a little bit of tightening, these could be way much better without going to full-on, you know, grognard rule, rule status. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but that's a thing to note, that these are cannons, they're artillery, the rules that mention artillery and, and cannons, they, they are the, one and the same thing. All right. So the Chickasaws can score a point if they defeat one of the, for each one, if they, you know, drive the Americans out, kill the swivel cannon and occupy it. While they're occupying it, they're considered to have a strategy point. So if they get, say, one of these and nine other points, they could win the game that way. The Americans potentially could drive them out. So technically, the Chickasaw have to have 10 strategy points by the end of the game. Obviously, if they've scored the three killing of the fleeing citizens and get the seven uh, 
destructions. That's it. They're going to have them. You can't undo that. They have won. Uh, but if they do take a blockhouse, which is very difficult to do, they have to hold that. Now, knowing the rules of, let's say, how many turns are, there is a 24 turn thing. So, well, obviously the turn ends at 24. Well, it's not that obvious in that every single one of the games from this company that I have always end, they have a 24 turn track. So it seems kind of weird that every single game, every single scenario, everything would, would be 24 turns. Eh, that seems a little weird, but that's what you got to go with. In this particular game, it doesn't say when the game ends, but you assume 24 turns. Uh, the other way for the Chickasaws to win is bum, 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 Fort Jefferson. If they ever, at any moment, get three British slash Chickasaw units into Fort Jefferson at that moment, boom, game over, they have won. Not easy to do, not easy to do, but that's possible. Historically, they never captured the fort, but they did enough damage to make the Americans decide to leave and abandon the fort. So by the end of the year, the Americans were gone. And in early 1781, the Chickasaw burned this all to the ground. So that's how you can win as the Chickasaw. Capture this fort with three people or get 10 or more strategy points. The key is if you can get all those fleeing civilians and these seven things here, that's it. You've won. The Americans have to prevent that. The Americans are going to lose unless, I believe, they have to rescue one or more of these sling civilians and get them into the fort. If they don't do that, they will live, lose because eventually the Chickasaw have enough force that they will take all seven destructions. And if they can kill these three, that's it. They don't even have to take any of the blockhouses. So very important part of the game is protecting those things. Let me finish setting up the game. So we had the three... Civil cannons in the blockhouses. Uh, let's see if we zoom in there. You can see little artillery symbols. So the Ford artillery go in those two spots. The other four spot, these are Illinois regulars, which are the Kentucky Militia of Virginia. George Roger Clark was the head of the Kentucky Militia of Virginia. That was his position. He's not represented in this game as a, as a, as a leader. Um, there are some cards that reference him, but, uh, now let's see, I'm going to zoom out here a little more so we can see that full board. Um, I don't need to push this back. These red spots are the entry spaces for the Chickasaw Indians. They come on to the board starting on turn one and, uh, technically, they don't have to move them all on the first. There's 12 different entry. There's, there's some down here that you can't see at the moment. Here. So this is Mayfield Creek. <laughs> this is called Island Number One. Uh, this is obviously technically an island, but you don't can't see how to get it. We'll talk about the rules of the Mississippi and the creek there. There is some ambiguity in the rules about that. But there are 12 entry positions for the Chickasaw. Cost them one movement point to enter. They could all potentially enter in you know, one or two of those. They could get multiple in per turn. There's not a limit on that, uh, but there's some special rules. Now, these militia, American militia, Cahokia militia, they came from Cahokia. They moved on down here. They have to start in these settlement hexes. These settlement hexes are considered buildings. They give a defensive bonus. You have to stop when you enter it, and you have a plus one defensive bonus. There are some building symbols inside the fort, which are technically not settlement hexes per se, but they are considered the same kind of buildings as these. The walls of the fort here give you great defensive benefit. You get a plus two on your defense if they're attacking across against the Americans. Uh, it does not stack. So attacking this guy is a plus one. This is a plus two. You just take the best. But let's say they manage to kill this artillery and get a guy over the wall. This guy attacking here, he would only have a plus one benefit from the building. Okay. Hilltops give you a plus one defensive benefit. Woods give you a plus one defensive benefit. It costs one more one movement point to move up the hill. Woods, you have to stop and enter. And you cannot attack out of them the turn you enter. Now, one of the rules in this game is if you move, you cannot shoot at range on your turn. All these infantry units have a range of two. That's this little symbol here. So we get attack, defense, and movement. That 
is range. Everything has a range of two, except for the Ford artillery. They have a range of four. These swivel cannons that are in the blockhouses, they have a range of two. They are special in that, see that times two symbol? They get to shoot twice. When, when you attack with them as a unit, they get to shoot twice. So they are quite powerful. Now, there are some limits on artillery when they attack in terms of their lethality. If they're shooting at range alone, we'll cover that in a minute. Let me finish setting up. So the, the decision points you have is where do your militia go and where do your two Kaskian, Kaskaskian natives go? Now, this guy is considered, in my mind, critical. You must, must attempt to keep this guy alive. So you may want to put your Kaskian over here. They, the option for the Kaskaskian natives are they either have to start on island number one or adjacent to any blockhouse. Now, there's a fort up here and two blockhouses and other artillery. You don't really have to worry about this here. This is a killing zone if the, if the <laughs> Chickasaw try to attack through here. Here is where you've got, you know, most of your vulnerability. So you may, you could put a, a Kaskaskian down here, potentially even to like slow down these guys, even sacrificially to try to hope to maybe get one of these guys away. Or you need them over here on the island. Um, if you put them on the island, I'm going to tell you, this is a bad setup. <laughs> These are crossing arrows. Let me talk about that real quick. You can't enter the Mississippi River. This is the Mayfield Creek. You can't enter the Mayfield Creek spaces that do not have a crossing arrow. All right? Now, there's ambiguities in the rules. They talk about streams. They talk about minor rivers. Those aren't in this game. They talk about... Mayfield Creek in t two different spots, sort of. They don't really define properly on here. Now, I've, I've, I'm going to close that off. I added this. It says allows crossing of creek, special crossing arrow, but no one on here. They talk about full river. They don't mention minor river. They don't mention stream. They don't show an entry on the terrain effects chart for the creek, but they mention it in the special rules and under terrain. This crossing arrow says allows crossing of creek. And in the, no, I, I had to see all this. I don't normally do this, but these rules had so many ambiguities and critical pieces of information just embedded within paragraphs, sometimes in a weird order. So I underlined and put stars on everything <laughs> because I felt you really have to parse this to this level to really understand how to play the game correctly. The playthroughs that I've seen had lots of errors. Now, to their credit, the, the players they later, when they played another of the games, they were playing some of the rules correctly that they had first misplayed. But uh, there are certain rules that you can easily misinterpret here. Um, so do, 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 somewhere in here, where did it say? Okay, in the special rules, it mentions Mayfield Creek. Uh, okay. The, the, the special movement arrows on the map signify the area the players may cross the Mayfield Creek without penalty. So according to that, it's not like a stream. It's not like a minor river. Without penalty means you can move on through, but only through those crossing arrows. All right. Now it does say up here under terrain effects, units attacked across an adjacent creek add plus one of the defense factors. Now, I interpret that to mean two things. If you're on the other side of the, the creek and the Chickasaws are shooting at you, you'd, you'd get a plus one. You are adjacent to the creek and you're being attacked. So, say, well, how does the stream help against rain? Well, there could be like a defilade, the embankment that they could sort of get behind. There might be more trees along the edge of the creek, etc. cetera. Um, if they're up next to it and close assaulting across, well, that makes sense that they're, you know, wading through. Even though there's no movement penalty, I could see getting a plus one. But that's the rule clearly states if you are adjacent to the creek and you're being attacked across, you get plus one in your defense. Now, I, I guess that even would apply like <laughs> if the Casca if excuse me, the Chickasaw was here and this artillery that can shoot from four more away is shooting one, two, three. This guy is adjacent to the creek. He's being shot at. Technically, he could add one to his defense. And again, maybe there's like a little definitely there's an embankment and then maybe there's 
where it goes down that you're sort of hiding a little bit at the, the creek's edge where there's more vegetation or some kind of deflated position. That sounds a little weird, but that is the way that the rule is written. Okay, now I was mentioning here why this is a bad setup. This unit right here, if you get hit, um, and I should might as well go ahead and explain how combat works. It's very simple. When you attack, you roll a die, and you add your attack factor. So let's take a Kaskaskin here. Or excuse me, that's a Kaskaskin. This is a Chickasaw. He's moved up. He's coming across the river. He's going to close assault. He's got a two strength. You'd roll a die and add two. The defender will compare it to his defense strength. Since this is the case of, oh, the creek adding plus one bonus, he would have a six. So this guy would roll a die six, adding two, and try to equal or exceed a six to get a hit. If you match or beat the defense number by one, you have got a retreat result where you disorder the enemy. That means you flip them over to the disordered side and they have to retreat and you have to retreat two spaces. If this guy had to retreat two spaces, you can't end up stacked. The only place you can stack is in Fort Jefferson. There can be two units. Only one can attack. Only one can defend. And if the stack has to retreat, the only stacking you should do in Fort Jefferson is the fleeing citizens. If you get them in there, you stick them under a combat unit and you're basically hiding them. That's the only stacking you should ever do in Fort Jefferson. But if you started in this defensive position, this guy came up here, and this is where you had your other guys, this guy has to retreat. No, he can't retreat to either one of those. He'd be eliminated instead. Now, if the Chickasaw guy is rolling his die and rolls a two, he adds two to his dice, and this guy's a six. If he rolled a six, it'd be an eight. An eight is two more than the net six defense. And if you're two or more, you kill outright. So at any time when you're attacking... Roll, roll your attack, add your attack, compare to the defense with any modifier. A hit of equal or one is a retreat result. Two or more is an outright kill. It's a lot harder to get those outright kills, especially when there's a lot of defense modifiers involved. All right, so I would not recommend this setup here. You could do something like this. So if this guy had to retreat, he could go to here. And you could potentially leapfrog him. If he got shot by someone in the next turn, he could retreat to here, etc. Um, you could just defend with one guy here. This guy could go, you know, one, two, three, four. And again, according to the rule, no penalty. Now, if this was a stream or a minor river, you would have to stop. But it's not. It's a creek with the crossing arrow. So this is totally impassable. This doesn't slow you. That seems a little weird to me. But according to the rules, you can move across with no penalty. This guy could get here and attack, close combat, and potentially could reach to here. This guy could advance. When you have combat and you push a guy back, you vacate the hex, you kill him or push him back. If you're not in a zone of control, you can advance. Uh, what this means is in some circumstances out here, when you're next to two units, you may push one guy back, but since you're next to another guy in a zone of control, you might not be able to advance. Um so if, if this guy retreated, got pushed back, he advanced here. In their turn, one, two, three, they could move away. You can leave a zone of control. You don't have to stay one, but you cannot move from zone to zone. If you're in a zone of control, you have to move out of a zone totally free and clear. And then you could come back into another zone, but you can never penetrate zone to zone. You have to stop when you're in a zone of control. If you want more likelihood to defend this guy, you could do this defense like this, or you could put this one guy here, uh, like I showed, and, and if he's, you know, if they're not lucky and don't shoot him, he could be defending here. And the advantage of this is, let's say we had our two, this guy came up here and to say he missed, one, two, three, four, this guy here. If he comes across next turn, he'd have to stop because he'd enter his own control. And if this guy was still sitting here, you could not move from here to here because of this guy's zone of control. So technically one guy here can tie this up, but as soon as he gets hit, so he has to retreat. If this guy's here, he would he could retreat out this way. And then this guy should not be able to advance to here because he can cross at the crossing arrow. Technically, I would not allow him. I would allow him to close combat across here because he's shooting, but I would not allow him to advance here. Again, that's one of the ambiguities. It doesn't really reference that in the rules, but... Uh, that's one of the things you just have to figure out how to best best play it and go with it. So 
if you want to defend over here too, I would not do this because this guy is in jeopardy. I would, would do this maybe. You could do this because this guy could go like this. And one, two, three, four. No one, no one moves five in this game. In a, some of the game, there's some five movement cavalry, but everyone moves four or three in this game or zero if you're the artillery pieces. Um, the subsequent turn, you'd have to stop here. So you could defend like this. You could defend like this. Or you may want to just have, say, one unit here. Uh, in which case, you, you could start there. Um, but, uh, you know, hoping the other turn to either move back. But if he gets retreated, he'll be there, which will temporarily block, you know, them for a while, unless he's just killed outright. This this is a potential play here, folks. This 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 area here is a place where the uh, the Chickasaw can storm in this way. They can come across this river. They could come this way, and if there's no, they can they can come up and get like three guys adjacent, get some guys two X's away. Now again, I think I mentioned the turn you move, you cannot shoot at ranged. So if you move up next to a guy, so it's I go, you go. The Chickasaw go, the American goes. When the when the you know you move up when you move your guys and then you attack. If you're next to someone, you can always attack. If you are at range, you cannot shoot if you move that turn. Okay, so if a bunch of Chickasaw poured over into this area here, let's say it's like this, and they moved up to attack, and they put some guys here in the backfield, they're they're hoping to do. <laughs> a lot of potential shooting at this fort. None of these guys could shoot the first turn. All right, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so those those all could potentially enter right here and, and do all this. They could even have more here. Uh, you got to be careful because if you put, one, two, three, four, if you put guys say here and here and here, you're packing them in. And if this guy had to retreat, he has nowhere to retreat to. You've got to avoid the zones of these guys and he couldn't stack up. Um, and we haven't mentioned it yet, but there is some defensive fire. So this would be bad to pack up this tight, trying to get these to close assault, these to shoot, and these guys are just moving up. These guys should not be here, milling around way back here. This guy could be here, because he could potentially shoot. If these guys didn't run, if these didn't move away, he could shoot at him and try to kill him next turn. <coughs> of course, it would actually be better for him and the next turn is if he moved into this square and close assaulted, because at the beginning of the next turn, he'd be in the square where he could destroy that. Uh, but that's some of the tactics you just have to think about once you've, you've learned it all. All right, so we were talking about sort of the strategy and the setup at the same time, how to play, why you might want to do something like this, <laughs> where you may want to keep them off this fort, because... The way these cards work is each turn, first thing you do in your turn is you draw a card. There's there's cards that tells you how many units you can move, how many you can attack with, and a special. You have to play this special and apply it. But each turn, eight units and five units attacking, ten and six. There are some where you're highly limited. Okay. <laughs> It's the tent where they're asking this fort to surrender. They can move six units, but they can't attack. They're being peaceful, asking for a surrender. So you might get a turn where you can't move anybody. Twelve and seven. Seven and only three. Paya uh, Ma Taha cautions peace. I'm not sure if that's a, a sub-leader, some, some like <laughs> lieutenant under Pio Minko or something. I do not know that history. But on average, these Chickasaw get a lot more moves and attacks each turn. The Americans... Well, this one's a big one. It's between nine and seven. Seven and two. None and three. Food shortage. Can't move anyone. Can only attack with three. Yeah, that'd be nasty. Eight and seven. Nine and five. Ten and seven. Eight and six. Seven and six. So four, but no militia. So on average, these are a little lower for the Americans. In some games, it's dramatically even more lower. So it's each, each game sort of balances uh, the cards help define the capabilities of the units that are involved. Um, so each turn you're drawing a card, you can move that many units, you can attack with that many units. 
You apply the special effect at the beginning. You look at it, you read it, you see what effect it has. It may impact your movement. It may impact your attacks. Now, on the first two turns, now the rules in this game say, the first two turns, there is an exception. See the special rules. Nowhere in the special rules they mention what the exception is. All right. Now, in another game, <laughs> in the Battle of St. Louis game, they have the same kind of thing where the first two turns, the British slash, uh, it's not that it's the it's the Sioux and the the Winnebago and a whole bunch of other Indians are attacking there, the the quote unquote slash British side. The first two turns, they still draw a card to look at the specials, but they ignore the movement and the combat portion. They can move as many as they want. They can fight with as many as they want. And in that, they specifically say, "Oh, the in that case, it's the Spanish." Uh, with I guess there's there there are some there's a bunch of Spanish forces there in St. Louis. There are uh, some of the same guys, the Illinois regulars, uh, Americans. Uh, they still use the cards for the first two turns. Now in this game, it just says you don't use the cards for the first two turns, and that's all it says. It's like you think, like, well, how do you determine how many to move? It doesn't say, but somewhere I inquired and the uh, designer said, oh, well, there's a rule in the other one. He, he never corrected the rule in this. I even went down and bought the the latest, greatest version on War Game Vault to see if he'd corrected it. They haven't. Uh, so that's something I'm going to pester him about that he needs to keep it up. And, and like if you order from Blue Panther right now, I mean, again, I love the games. <laughs> There should be an errata. They should fix these. They could easily get the new version just printed immediately. Print on demand. It's the only thing. I don't know if you're buying it from uh, Noble Knight Games, and they, I don't know if they have any more of these in stock or not. Um, but you know, if you're getting a fresh printed one, you should have the new rules. They should, should make some corrections. But so I'm playing the same way. It's it's doing it in the St. Louis Battle of St. Louis game. So for the Chickasaw, the first two turns, they're drawing their card. They're using the special event part, but they can move as many guys as they want to and attack them. Now, that's big. That is really big because they can swarm down here big time and potentially try to hope to maybe actually, you know, show like I was doing, storm this uh, this blockhouse and maybe kill this swivel cannon. And so you may want to sacrifice the Kaskaskian here. <laughs> to try to thwart that and slow them down. Um, and, and that could help you possibly escape because there's no way, one, two, three, four, they cannot get next to either of these two guys the first two turns, uh, the first turn. Uh, so you can't move and shoot at range. So these guys are going to get an opportunity to move unless there's this one card in here, like we saw a food shortage where the Americans can't move. If you draw a food shortage on the first turn, you're really toast because that means you cannot move these guys back. Potentially one, two, three, they could get into the, the buildings or something. You gotta remember, you have to stop. So like, this guy couldn't go one, two, three. He'd have to stop at one of these buildings. But this guy, one, two, three, he could get back to here. So where you put your militia, these militia here also start. Uh, so maybe one here thinking this guy can escape to here. Um, maybe one here again. You're trying to form a line. You maybe, you might sacrifice and counterattack. These guys could be coming through here. It's like, oh my goodness, what what do you want to do? You you might need to form a back part here. These guys could potentially move up. I mean, you could try to put more firepower here, but uh, I I like the idea of leaving a a gap maybe for him to get in. Um, <laughs> I don't know where that. See, if you put them here and here, he could move here. Uh, but see this, this, thinking about it, thinking about it. All right, so the other option might be here and here. Where, see, one, two, three, four. They could actually get across. Uh, <laughs> you might not want to be right here where they could actually get close assault you the first turn. Now, you might want to be, say, here, where if they move across here, you could shoot at them. Um, but you can't potentially shoot with everybody. Well, okay, we didn't mention, we mentioned uh, you move, you attack. You can't 
shoot at range the turn that you move. But after you move, before you attack, the other side gets defensive fire. And defensive fire is three. You can shoot three units at anything that you could legitimately shoot in range or next to you in close combat. Now, three units, not three attacks. What that means is if you shoot with a swivel cannon, which is one unit, they get to shoot twice. So potentially, if these Chickasaw stormed up and got within range or next to, you know, all three of these uh, blockhouses, the swivel cannons in it, during defensive fire, the swivel cannons, you could fire all three of them, you could potentially get six attacks. <laughs> all right? So the Chickasaw have to be careful about maybe charging up too much too fast and maybe not getting, you know, their, they have their five and six strength Chickasaw dudes. The three leaders have a seven defense. You got to be careful. Um, so potentially a dude could come up and block this or not. Uh, 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 come down. All right, so if he sits here on this as a target, like I'm going to defend it, he can potentially shoot at anyone that comes across the river on the second turn. He could move over here to potentially try to block this. He could step up. Like if he moves here on turn one, on turn two, they could move past and he could step up maybe. Um, I'm going to do this. I'm going to sacrifice this guy here. I don't want him in here, though. You're going to have to stop here. Got to watch out where you're going to get surrounded. One, two, one, two. If you, he's here, potentially you could retreat down this way. You'd have room to retreat down here. If you're here, you could retreat this way. This is probably a little safer. They could cut here. And then later they can move around this way. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put him there. <laughs> All right, so four militia. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> risk the Kaskaskin here. My gut feeling is I really want two here. Uh, one, two, three. You can stop him here. He gets a defense bonus. If he's killed, well, he's good anyway. Doesn't matter. Um, by going here, one, two, three, four. They still could attack you. Three, four. If this guy retreats, he doesn't retreat. He could just move. So yeah, this is this is the place in my mind to be. If you're just doing one, if you're doing two, you'd probably defend here. Uh, but I'm going to try this here. I'm going to do whatever I can to try to at least get maybe <laughs> one or two fleeing citizen into the fort. All right. So we have mentioned. I go. You go. Driven by the cards. You pull a card at the beginning of your turn. Tells you how many you can move, how many you can attack with, but read the special rule first, apply it uh, at the appropriate time, but know that it could change how many units you could you could move or not. Um, it also there's allows potential bonuses to attack in some cases or limitations on attack. <coughs> so as I mentioned, shooting at range, everything but it has a two range except the fleeing citizens and the Fort of Chile have a four range. If you've moved in your turn, you cannot range attack, but you may close attack. When you enter uh, next to an enemy unit, you must stop. You're in their zone of control. If you are attacking and you're an enemy zone of control, you must attack one of those adjacent units. You don't have to attack all of them, but you can't shoot someone else at range if you are in a zone of control. What that means is if, for example, uh, let's say this guy is... Is, is dead. If Piominko is here, so he's got a seven strength. This swivel cannons is in the zone of control of Piominko. This guy here only has a five defense. This swivel cannon could not shoot at the five strength guy because he's in the zone of control. He would have to attack the guy that he's in the zone of control of. All right.
Okay, so on, on the combat rules, I mentioned if you roll the die, add the attack strength, compare the defense strength with any defensive modifiers. Defensive modifiers are plus one for a building, plus one for woods, plus one for hilltop, plus two for the blockhouses, plus two shooting across the Fort Jefferson wall from the outside. If you get inside the wall, it doesn't matter. You're, you're attacking in here, and it's whether they're in the building or not. If you're adjacent to the creek and you're attacked across it, you get plus one defense. Uh, as I mentioned, buildings, you get plus one defense. So these fields and the destruction spots, that all that doesn't add anything. Okay, that's added to your fence. If you equal or exceed by one, the guy has to retreat. You cannot retreat through zone of controls. You cannot retreat. You can treat through friendly units. You can't through enemy units or zone of controls. You cannot end up stacking, stacked when you retreat, except if you're retreating, say, into the fort and you meet that max two stacking limit there. When you retreat, you are disordered. So you're flipped over to this side. Disorder is removed at the rally phase. At the end of your turn, any of your guys that are rallied, you'll be able to flip over. So if in the... Chickasaw turn, they hit an American unit and disorder them. It won't be till the end of the American turn that they can rally and flip over. If defensive fire happens, so let's say the Chickasaws move up, they're attacking here, and the Americans shoot their defensive fire. They can use three units. Maybe they use this one, this one, and this one. And boom, 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 they disorder a couple of these guys, and they go retreating back. This is during the Chickasaw's turn. They moved up. They do the combat. This guy could shoot. At the end of their turn, these guys will be able to flip back over. Okay? They will not be disordered in the next turn because they were disordered during the defensive fire. Okay? Now, special rules about blockhouses. And this is important because this is easy to misplay. It's one of the rules that the uh, players they weren't quite exactly playing right. A blockhouse is adding two to your defense. These swivel guns have a seven... That's a nine. You've got to get nine or greater to affect them. Now, one of the rules that says a blockhouse is an American unit in a blockhouse ignores the retreat result. However, it goes on to say they are still disordered. They don't have to retreat, but they're still disordered. Okay. Now, if you're in a zone of control, you cannot rally from disorder. So if the Chickasaw can keep enough units next to these forts and they disorder a swivel cannon, it's not going to be able to rally and get undisordered. And if they get disordered again, they're destroyed. So even though the blockhouse allows you to ignore the retreat portion of a retreat result, you're still disordered. If you get another, what would be a quote-unquote retreat result, the rule says, if you are already disor disordered, you are eliminated instead. So if you get the retreat with disorder result, but you're already disordered, you're eliminated instead. So a disordered, so you could potentially roll a nine to be equal and get a disorder. And then if you get another nine, you could kill it off. Now you're saying, how is it possible to get a nine? Well, all these guys only have two strengths. Okay. So I haven't mentioned yet combined arms. If you're attacking by yourself, either close combat adjacent or at range, you roll your attack strength to the die roll. And you can roll a six and adding two, you get an eight. You can't roll a nine. Well, a combined attack means you have one unit attacking normally with his strength and you take another unit and they just add plus one. Doesn't matter what the strength is. Two units together can add one to the dude with the greater strength, okay? There's also some cards that give you bonus on the die rolls, okay? So potentially... In this game, you could add up to three to your die roll. In this game, there are no plus two bonuses, and some there are. So like in, in that Battle of St. Louis game, there is a card that gives you plus two to combat. I think it's, I think it's for the Winnebago's. They, they can get a plus two on their die roll uh, in a certain, certain, certain circumstance of the card. And so that's potent. Yeah, there are no plus twos in this game. But you could potentially have a two-strength unit attacking, combined arms, that's adding two plus one is three, so you could roll a six. You could get another plus one for the card that's adding four. So potentially you could roll a ten. So with a nine or a ten, 
with these guys being disordered, you know, if a hit this start would disorder them, they wouldn't retreat. And another one of those, if they don't get a chance to rally, if they didn't drive, someone drove off the, the adjacent Indians, you could kill this guy. Now, there is a card, both sides have a card where they can rally their dudes immediately, regardless of zone of controls. So that could save your position like, oh, I'm being swamped. My guys are disordered, but boom, you could rally them. All right. So you do not have to get a two or greater result to, to kill these guys, which is great. You, you, you can't roll an 11 normally. One, two, three, four, out of six, 10. So you, you, you have to get a equal or greater, disordering them, and then do it again. All right, before they rally. Now, one last rule. I think we've got everything covered except for a special rule about artillery. Artillery pieces, the cannons, the swivel cannons and the two fort cannons, if they attack alone, not part of the combined attack, artillery attacking alone at range cannot get an auto-eliminate result. That means if they roll two more net than the defense, they don't automatically eliminate the guy. When they're bombarding at range, at best you can do is disorder the dude. So these three strength fort artilleries shooting four hexes away, they're getting to add, you know, three to their die roll. And these, you know, about half the Chickasaw Indians have a five and half have a six. It's not exactly half, but close. So this guy, a seven or greater, will kill him outright. A five or a six, if you say he's in the open, he's not in defensive terrain. And it, when you're swamping these, these, these areas, you have to get up next to him and you have some guys at range. You don't have much defensive terrain, right? So they're vulnerable. So a seven or greater would kill him normally, outright. So a... A militia guy adding two to a die and rolling a five or a six would get a seven or eight. That would kill one of these guys outright. A strength six strength guy, he'd have to roll the six, adding two to get an eight and kill him outright. But the artillery cannot kill it. Now, the rule is artillery attacking alone at range cannot get the auto kill. That means a swivel cannon attacking a guy adjacent to them. That's close combat that's not at range he could kill a dude so all these uh you know guys swarming up against these swivel forts and and the swivel forts you know the swivel cannons in the blockhouse forts could shoot twice adding two and he could roll a five or a six making it a seven or eight two or more bam bam in defensive fire or during his turn, he could potentially kill two units outright during their turn. So again, attacking the swivel forts, you got to be very careful. You probably want to use your six defense guys or the seven strength leaders. You got to be careful though. Those are very valuable. These are some of the guys where you get bonuses on the cards. Like if you're near Piamenko or, you know, Whitehead and X number, or the Whitehead unit himself gets a plus one or something like that. So artillery attacking alone, at range, cannot get the auto kill. If they're already disordered, any hit kills you. Or you could do a combined attack. So you might have, for example, a Chickasaw guy here. The fort could bombard it. This guy could combine attack shooting. So this guy would have a three. Plus one for that is adding four. Rolling four. On a one or a two, they'd get a normal hit, disorder them and treat them. And on a three or greater, they would kill him automatically. <laughs> so this guy sitting there in the face of this is in real trouble. That's that's weak sauce. Okay? Because it's not an artillery attacking alone, it's a combined. Now, technically, that even means two artillery attacking together are not alone. So this swivel fort and this guy could attack him, and potentially together they could kill him outright. Uh, you'd, you'd probably be be better off shooting with the swivel guy at him first. And if he had to retreat and he went to something here, this guy, one, two, three, four, could shoot a separate shot at the guy where he retreated and he'd be disordered and you'd just have to hit him regularly and kill him. So anyway, just you got to know what the rule is. You got to carefully parse these rules. Like I said, some of these rules are kind of ambiguous. <laughs> you, you, you have to carefully parse them using English, but also wargamer experience knowledge. And if you're not 
an experience where you may easily misplace some of these rules um, because they, they <laughs> there's real import to what they're saying and how they say it that's easy to miss potentially if you're not an experienced word gamer. Now, again, I've said this before in other games, I'm not bashing these games at all. I love these games. The history in them, the flow in these are great. They're great fun. They're not detailed simulations of these battles, but boy, do they catch the flavor. This this is American Revolution in the far west frontier. Did you know that there were all these battles going on in 1780 and thereabouts happening during the American Revolutionary War? Uh, this 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 is amazing what this guy has done in presenting these games and, and th these situations. I absolutely love them. However, he needs to tighten up his rules. I'm going <laughs> to write a letter this week offering my services to, to proofread any games that he comes out in the near future. I'll, I'll gladly try to help him out there and help because I've I've made my own games before. I have uh, uh, taken a class on <laughs> rules creation and game design, all that kind of stuff. So I think we're at the end here. I, I may have missed some tiny bits of Chrome. We will we will cover that as I start to do a playthrough. We covered the victory conditions, the Chickasaw. Three units in the fort, instant win. Otherwise, you need 10 points. You can kill three of the fleeing citizens. You can destroy seven of those. That would be enough. And or get one only one point for the the things. If, if they get some uh, fleeing citizens in the fort, you're going to have to at least fight their way into the fort somehow or, or take one of those uh, blockhouses. That's how you win. I go, you go, but using the cards... Uh, the Americans do follow the cards the first turn. The Chickasaw don't for the movement or attack portion. Uh, da, 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 da. You can't attack at range if you've moved that turn. Oh, zero movement units cannot retreat. Now, we already know that American units in the blockhouses don't have to retreat. If a Chickasaw unit captures one of these, the Americans could drive them out, and they'd, they don't get that... They get the plus two defensive benefit, but they don't get the ignore retreat benefit. Now, these artillery in the fort are somewhat vulnerable in that even though they get a plus two defense for the walls, if they have to be retreated, if they get the disordered retreat result, they will die because they cannot retreat because of the zero moon lines. They're not protected like those guys are. All right. Uh, da -da -da -da. Oh, the game turn is double-sided. You just flip it over as you do each turn. Uh, you put the eliminated units in each side. You can get some back, like I said, but you... Americans cannot get back the fleeing citizens. Uh, da, 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 da. Pretty much covered any, everything that I can think of at this point. Defensive fire. Um, oh, yeah. Any any bonus like from the card, you're getting a plus one bonus from the card. That's per attack. So when you do a quote-unquote combined attack of two units to, to add together, like I showed, to where you take one guy for his attack strength and add one in, that's two units attacking. So your card might say you have seven units to attack with. If you do a combined attack using two units, that uses up two, but it's only, it's one attack. You only get like your plus one bonus once. You don't have to do it for each unit. It's one attack. All right. Uh, I think that's everything. I'm going to call it quit here. We're almost uh, over 53 minutes. I had absolutely no intent to go this long, but between the history and going over again, some of these rules, uh, as I actually do a playthrough, We'll cover, oh, there's some line of sight rules. You can't shoot over uh, other units uh, except for, like, artillery in the... Uh, you can shoot over friendly units with artillery, but not enemy units, which might make if there was a, 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 say, a Chickasaw here, you couldn't shoot at the Chickasaw behind him, for example. Um, yep, we're going to call, call it that. That is... Fort Jefferson attack game. They put game in the name, which makes sense. This this guy, you know, he's a book publisher. He He's helped support it and created a museum. So if he's selling this in the museum, people don't know. That's a game. This isn't a book. This isn't, you know, a pack of postcards or posters. It's a game. So that's why I think all, every single one of their games I've seen has game in the name. Fort Jefferson attack game. Battle of St. Louis game, etc. So great stuff. You can find some of these online at Historical Game Company. The better way at this point to get them is through Blue Panther. You might be able to find them like at Noble Knight Games. Uh, 
they're they're decent price, especially considering that they have the the uh, canvas map. Um, so we are going to call it quits here, folks. Uh, thank you for watching this very lengthy how to play. So to all you good folks out there, take care and ciao.